Andrew Millen, and you're listening to the Celtic Soul Podcast. It's episode 70, and my guest on the show today will be Tommy Sheridan. Tommy is from Glasgow, a Celtic supporter, political activist, a former member of the Scottish Parliament, a tireless campaigner for an independent Scotland, and he even popped up a few years ago on Celebrity Big Brother. I'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Kylie Heating Limited from Balbriggan, County Dublin. Big thank you to Bill, always supports us. Thank you very much, Bill, and hope to see you next season on the road to Glasgow. If your business is Celtic minded or Celtic Supporters Club would like to support the podcast and sponsor an episode, please email us at info at celticfanzine.com and you can also contact us through the website or message us on social media. We've decided to keep all the podcasts free of charge. There's nothing behind the paywall or Patreon. So if you'd like to support us, you can do so by donating for the price of a pint or a coffee, if you can afford it, of course. Thanks again, folks, for suggestions for guests for the show and also for your comments. And here's a few from last week on the podcasts. Great insight into Gary Kelly, the man and all the marvellous things he's done for cancer charities. Yet another quality listen. Like I said, my regular commentator, I suppose, Tony Ratton in Sunderland. Brilliant podcast. Cheers. Never had the pleasure of seeing the pilgrims. The pod led me to listen to the album. Grandad was a Celtic man. Brilliant. And like was it in Kenny 67. And our YouTube channel, Celtic Fanzine TV, maybe a slow boner, but Kenny found us through the YouTube channel and not on, on actually any podcast platform or our own website. So thanks very much for the comment, Kenny, and thanks for listening. And on last week's Celtic Soul podcast, a few comments on Jason Maloney's if this is as good as Jason's Facebook status, this is going to be an absolute tremendous listen. And that comes in from Steo Kelly. Steo, I hope you did listen and it was as good as his Facebook status. Fair enjoyed that, lads. Always important to remember the amount of hours you guys put in supporting that club. And that comes in from David McLaughlin, an employee of Celtic. Thank you, David. And we're looking forward to getting an old tour off you when we can back at Celtic Park. Great listeners all the pods have been. Jason mentioned the cup game at Hamden against the Scum in 1992. Same as him, I remember leaving Hamden that night like a drowned rat, beaten by 10 men, thinking as we did at the time that this was the way it was going to be forever. Better days were ahead. Love the pods. Keep it there. And I can sit Mark Jordan. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for your continued support. Jason Maloney made me remember Turin when we met late at night, worse for wear, and he asked me, did I know Gary Griffin? Not to mention the night in Tallinn when you and Paul Conroy bunked into our room, which was a dungeon. And that actually comes in from Gary Griffin. So I know Jason has found Gary and does know Gary, but boy, Jason, there must have been some drink taken that night in Turin before the Juventus game. And then on, on Celtic Fans in TV, folks, which also hosts some of the podcasts, some great words of wisdom in those two hours with Paul Heaton. That was it from David Gartland. So anyone who hasn't listened to the Paul Heaton podcast, the, the full uncut conversation, I suppose, is on our YouTube channel now. And on Aaron Boyle's tribute to Scott Brown, the poem we put out on the YouTube channel entitled Bruni, awesome tribute to the trophy winning machine. And there's no name at that, but thanks for the comment. And Henry McKenna goes on to about Jeanette Finley's Call It Out interview we put up also on the YouTube channel. Great statement from a very intelligent lady. And there was loads of comments on, on Jeanette um, across all the platforms. And if you haven't heard our little interview or the snippet we put up, go on to Celtic Fanzine TV and you'll see it. And then one comes in from Emerald Abroad. Time for this channel to get the subs up. Come on, boys and girls. And yes, folks, if you can, go on to the YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button. Because when we build up our audience and we build up the subscribers, we can start putting out more and more content and more and more quality content as we kind of go hopefully next season back on our fan journey throughout Scotland and in hopefully in Europe and we we as always we will tell the static story through the fans eyes so folks thanks very much for those comments uh, keep them coming in there was so much this this week because probably we put out a bit of content and I just want to finish with some um, comments on articles that appeared on the website the level of mindless violence and aggression is not needed. We have enough problems to deal with, such as COVID-19, environmental issues, and global poverty. And that comes in from James Bourne, and that was on the Call It Out article by Tommy Sheridan, which appeared on the website. Wow, what an inspirational piece of journalism. And that comes in from David Potter's article on Bobby Mordock on the anniversary of his death last Saturday. And that comes in from Michael J.J.J. Kennedy. I have to get all the J's in. But it was memorable gold. Thought the stand was going to collapse. 
Amazing. And that comes in from the goal article on Henrik Larsson's goal in Bovista uh, that Matt and Donaldson wrote last week. And I think it was Saturday, it was on the podcast. And that comes in from Dave Maloney. Well, last Saturday, the final whistle blew on Celtic's poor, poor season. The game was played out at almost a walking pace in Edinburgh. As some fans almost fell asleep watching both teams go through the motions. At times it even looked like a pre-season friendly. In the words of average Joe Miller from Not The View, it was like watching walking football, which brought me back to an episode of Father Ted. And you can catch Joe on the Talk of the Terrors podcast with me on our YouTube channel, Celtic Fanzine TV. That came out last night if you want to check it out. And then what else did we witness on Saturday? Only a hate-filled Glasgow City when Georgia Square was torn into a war zone with punches and bottles thrown freely under a chorus of fuck the Pope while up to their knees in Fenian blood as videos emerged throughout the day of the chaos, including one of the team, yes, the Rangers team, in full flow, singing it at a function after the game. While back in the city centre, local businesses were forced to close. The Celtic shop had to close, the Irish bars had to close, and all the restaurants and bars who have been hit so hard during COVID-19 had to close their doors as Glasgow became an open toilet and after they got fed up punching each other they turned their attention violently towards the police and I seen one picture of a police officer in a ranger scarf so totally unprofessional by that guy and I hope he's pulled up in it if it was copper in a Celtic scarf I'm sure he'd be definitely suspended as we speak and the actions of those idiots was rightly called out by decent people and Jeanette Finley pulled no punches in defending the Irish Catholic community on TV on Monday. And just when you thought people could go no lower, we received a press release from Celtic which read, We can confirm that significant damage has been caused to Peter Lowell's house and vehicles there following an explosion and fire early this morning, forcing the family to leave the property. Clearly, Peter's family are extremely shaken and shocked by these terrible events, but thankfully are all safe. We understand that Police Scotland are currently undertaking a criminal investigation. Peter and his family will, of course, receive the full support and care of everyone at the club. And we echo those sentiments. Paddy McMenamin, who writes for us regularly in more than 90 minutes and on the website, summed it up when he wrote, Celtic Chief Executive Peter Lawwell's house attacked with petrol bombs as his wife and children slept inside. Like last week's events, that's not celebrating your culture. That's out and out sectarian bigotry, which must be stamped out. And you can read that full article if you visit CelticFanzine.com. With events like these going on and what's happening in Palestine, the way for Celtic to announce a manager seems insignificant at the moment, but we still remain hopeful of some good news coming out from the club soon about who will be appointed Celtic manager, who will be in the dugout with him, and what players will be coming in and out. Delighted of Tommy Sheridan returning to the Celtic Soul podcast. The last time he was with us was last August and so much has happened since then. And we had a great response to Tommy on the podcast, so it's lovely to have him back. Tommy's been a contributor to more than 90 minutes and also to our website, CelticFansing.com. And as I said earlier, Tommy, Celtic supporter, political activist, former member of the Scottish Parliament, a tireless campaigner for an independent Scotland. He's took part in so many political debates over many decades and he was recently the subject of sectarian abuse himself as Rangers fans passed his house on the way into the sea and not for the first time this season Tommy and his wife have been subjected to that and we get into that when we're in conversation. Hi Tommy, a very welcome back to the Celtic Soul podcast. It's hard to believe it was last August when you were a guest on the show. A lot has happened since then, on and off the park. Back then Celtic had exited the Champions League But none of us saw the collapse that would follow as the season progressed and went from bad to worse. Neil Lennon would lose his job, a man you had openly backed, and performances and results didn't improve under John Kennedy as the long way continues for the announcement of a new manager. Andrew, thanks very much for the invitation to to come back on uh, board. It's important that you keep the podcast going, um, especially the lack of communication from um, Celtic Park. Uh, this type of broadcast, this type of forum, uh, is the lifeblood of, of the club now. I mean, uh, the fans are having to become the form of communication. Um, so please keep it going, Paul, as best you can. More than 90 minutes is well respected. Um, and I also have read that you're going to be linking up 
with the Willie Mealy Memorial Group as well and, and getting someone on from that, which is brilliant. I want to give a big shout out to them right at the outset and ask every Celtic fan to get involved with that, support it if you can for, uh, financially, spread the word. Uh, it's a fantastic objective they've got to build a fitting memorial to Celtic's legendary manager in his place of birth. Please help them out, the Willie Mealy Memorial Group. Last time we spoke, Andrew, we were sad. we just exited the Champions League, as you say, Fer and Varis had uh, beat us 2-1 at home. Um, Lennon got a lot of stick for the team that he selected that night. You'll remember that uh, Kamala and Ayeti were on the bench. Uh, Edward was injured and uh, Christie started up front. Um, you may also remember we had 20 shots that night, eight of them on target. Um, Christie actually scored. Um, in Cham at the bar we had a perfectly good goal chopped off uh, and then Varkas did the unthinkable and uh, allowed two goals and the second one was was farcical with the near post if you remember uh, you and I could have saved that thing but anyway um, what then happened um, is interesting Andrew in terms of the narrative of our season because not a lot of Celtic fans will remember this but we then went in an eight game winning run six of them clean sheets we appeared to be turned in the corner. And then, if you remember, the Motherwell game, before playing the Rangers at Parkhead, eight games undefeated, six of them without losing a goal, and big Julian gets injured in the Motherwell game, hits his knee against the post, and can he play against Rangers? I've got to say to you, given the form that we were in, given the fact that we had six previous shutouts in a row, I just wonder if Goldson would have scored either of his goals if Julian had been playing that day. So it's been a season, Andrew, of disappointments, but it's also been a season of ifs, buts, maybes, and a hell of a lot of bad luck. A hell of a lot of bad luck. If you fast forward, because obviously we had a disaster that particular game. Uh, we, we were insipid. We didn't have a shot on target. It was inexplicable how you could go I mean, Lenny got the manager of the month. <laughs> if you remember that, he got the manager of the month in September. He was doing so well. And then we get absolutely uh, defeated badly at Parkhead. Really terrible result. And then, I don't know if you remember this, we picked up in December. Do you remember picking up in December? We yes. went on a six-game run again. And uh, again, uh, you know, remind yourself of this. We go to Ibrox. We are 13 points behind. But we've got three games in hand. If we beat Rangers at Ibrox, we are then only looking at a, a gap of 10 points with three games in hand. You have a situation where you win your three games in hand, you've still got two games against Rangers. The, the race, the title race is on. And then think about what happened that day, uh, Andrew. We outplayed them. We bossed them. We were way on top. We missed a few guilt chances. And then a rush of blood to near Beaton's head and he gets sent off. By the way, it is interesting, just again, with comparisons, Andrew. I know you and I like these types of things, but it's funny how uh, pulling down Morales 25 yards from goal was a goal-scoring opportunity, and therefore he sent off. But pulling down uh, or pushing Lee Griffiths six yards out to the, the goal line wasn't a goal-scoring opportunity, and Aribo stayed on the park uh, during, the, during the cup game. But there you go. Uh, them's the breaks that, that, that we seem to get. So, listen, mate, it's also a great in some respects. It's crying after the milk is, has been spilt. Um, but I was dead disappointed. Um, I, I, I consider Neil a, a good man. I consider him a good manager. I was disappointed it never worked out for him. Um, they then delayed, let, let's be honest, after Christmas, things get delayed beyond the inevitable. Uh, I, I I thought the, the Dubai trip was a PR disaster. Um, nothing to do with him at the end of the day um, but to, to to take Julian who's injured when it's supposed to be a, a, a programme of fitness um, and then he, for him to contract the, the COVID and then for 13 of the staff to have to isolate it was just an absolute PR disaster and the idea that Neil took the dairy for that you know that he took the responsibility he had to march eventually for that but I tell you what, there's a lot of others should have had to march for that because whoever went ahead with that trip at that time 
that was about money as far as I'm concerned, Andrew. That was about sponsorship. That was about deals that had been done off the park that led to them going ahead with that trip. It should never have went ahead. Uh, it treated us with a wee bit of contempt. Um, and it, it was it epitomised the season as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, just, I don't want to go back over the whole season. I, I thought the best we played, Tommy, was coming up to the Rangers game in Oibrox. I thought there was a few changes made. There was a bit of, bit of freshness about the team. And then we go, we go to Oibrox and, as you say, the beat on fell. He marches. And then the, the whole Dubai COVID fiasco, as you say, you know, you're bringing over Julian, a player that's injured. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And for me, I suppose, as a fan, the hardest thing, Tommy, and, and, and the saddest thing was the divide within the support because, you know, that suits, that suits the board to have us divided when we should be united. And even now when we have this wonderful offer from the Trust to give the fans shares if they wish to take them for season books, which value for the season books for last season. But even in that, no one else had, had, had given us any other suggestions or put anything forward to the board that I know of. And yet we couldn't, we couldn't even unite behind that, which, which disappoints me because everyone thinks that someone has a, has a hidden agenda when I think anyone that knows the trust knows that 20 years they've had no hidden agenda. They've been doing the work that maybe others don't want to do. And I go back to the legal cases in Amsterdam, the legal cases with the fans against criminalisation, you know, which probably took them away from what the what the trust was set up for was to unite the small shareholders. But I know, Tommy, that there's massive work going on behind the scenes. Even in Ireland, we have a list of all the shareholders, the small shareholders, and Mark Bork in Dublin is working tirelessly through that list and it's over 5,000 to contact these and because a lot of them have come they don't know that they've moved house so they don't know what the story is with the shares and they're actually owed a few quid so there is uh, uh, how bad the season was Tommy something good came out of it with, with the with the trust growing the membership and also with, with the Super League it also brought it back you know on the agenda that you know this could happen to us what's happened to these English clubs and then UEFA, you know, sneaky UEFA, changing the Champions League again. We now have a final this year when we've two teams who are not the, who were not the champions of the league last year, and you know they're trying to make out these bad guys in, in in the Super League. They're as bad as them because they don't want the champions of Ireland competing in it or the champions of Albania or the champions, and that's what the European Cup was. It was a back in the day, Celtic played Dundalk, they played Waterford. And, and that's all gone now because it's all about the big clubs playing as many games against each other as possible. So if there is a positive come out of the season, that's one small positive that came out that it kept us aware. It's put us back on our toes that we could wake up one morning and the club could be taken over by people who are not, who don't share what the majority of people share. A Celtic, you know, it, I know it's a corporate, it's a corporate um, slogan. You know, a club like no other, but there is there is clubs like us, but there's there's not that many now, and I think we 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 really need to hold on to our identity. And you know, the, the more fans that have shareholding in the club can only be a positive. No, there, there's no doubt about that, Andrew. And obviously, nothing is ever wholly bad, and nothing's ever wholly good. That there's always. A, a, an edge, there's always a, an aspect of something, there's always you know, people say two sides to stories there's usually three or four sides to stories and, and what I think we have to develop in relation to what happened in the unsavoury scenes I thought there were unsavoury scenes I, I was disappointed with the way the fans turned in and personalised it against Lenin, I think it was wrong, people will say oh you're a pal of his I mean, my pal of his I don't. I, I can't remember the last time. The last time I spoke to Neil. I'll tell you, the last time I spoke to Neil personally um, was the last season's game at Ibrox when um, when we went through now when uh, uh, Johnny Hayes scored the, the, the second goal. Um, and I remember Martin really phoned us to, to say, you know, how well it was, and he said Neil wants to have a chat with you and to thank you for some of the support. Because I remember, if you can remember that season, we had a similarly bad result against Cluj. Um, and everybody was going mental and calling for him to be sacked and everything else. We then had a cup game against Dunfermline that, that nearly went the extra time. Um, we, 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 we won it 
And then from then on, we went on a fantastic run. And, you know, we went on and secured the, the, the treble and we had some great results in, in the course. And we were playing some great football as well, because if you remember, we started playing the two up front. We started having uh, Griffiths and Eddie up front. Um, so that's the last time I've spoken to Neil. So when people slag me about, oh, you're only defending him because he's a mate, he's not exactly a bosom buddy. He's somebody I respect. He's somebody who I think had the best interest of the club at heart. And, and he's somebody who undoubtedly thought he was going to be able to turn around the situation. And, you know, statistically speaking, after the Ferran Varis uh, uh, game, some people criticised him because he appeared to attack some of the players who he said were trying to work their way out of the, the, the club. And maybe he shouldn't have done that. Maybe that was a mistake. But, you know, you can't have it both ways, uh, Andrew. You can't have somebody who you think isn't showing enough passion, isn't showing enough commitment. You know, how many times did you hear Lennon getting slagged because his deportment on the, the side of the lines wasn't good enough? It didn't appear as though he cared and all the rest of it. So after that game, he comes out and he's obviously angry. He thinks he's not getting effort for some of his players. And rightly or wrongly, and some people will say wrongly, he had a go at some of his players. And, and people say, that never works. We went on an eight-game winning run. We went on a run where we had six games without losing a goal. We went to that game at Parkhead looking as though we were going to get back on top. And then the wheels come off the bus. As I say, we lost Julian in the game. Uh, before that game, we then start with young Welsh and big uh, Shane Duffy and, and things go awry. So I'm not going to backtrack uh, Mark, uh, 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 Andrew on, on my defence of of Neil I think he deserved to be defended um, I think some of the fans have got to reflect on whether they think the vitriol and the anger and some of the disgusting posters and things w was that helpful I, I don't think so they will say well we want to get listened to it was our only way of being heard maybe that's a, a, a justification I don't agree um, I, I think it didn't portray the club in the light that we like to portray a club in. But it was indicative of things beginning to go wrong. And we see when everything's going well, <laughs> everybody's your mate, isn't it? When, when think, you know, you know your own life, when everything's going well in your life, you've got loads of mates. You only find out who your real mates are when things begin to go badly in your life and you need <laughs> to actually find who your real pals are. The bullets are starting to fly. Who's still standing beside you? Uh, everybody's stoning when the sun's out, but no everybody's there when the clouds gather. And I think that's what happened in some respects. We had a, a layer of Celtic fans who over the last 10 years have known nothing, nothing but success. They have grown an entitlement almost to expect to win things. Many young guys, 17, 18, 19, 20, their whole life has been about winning, winning, winning. And then suddenly uh, we had a, a challenge um, and even if you go back further on this, I'm sorry to go over old ground, Andrew, but it is important to do this because I can recall putting posts up on Facebook and making comments about the squad that we had assembled at the start of the season and thinking, well, we're going to do it. I mean, how many players, uh, sorry, how many fans thought bringing in Shane Duffy was going to be the icing on the cake, that the, this was going to give us the steel in defence that we'd been lacking? Uh, he was going to be the leader on the park at the back. We had a leader in the park in Bruni in, in the middle. Uh, we knew what Edward could do. Shane Duffy was going to be the, the leader at the back. We were all disappointed we never get Fraser. But hey, we got the Greek number one. We got the Greek number one. So at the start of the season, Andrew, I, I think you'd be lying if people start saying, no, oh, I knew it was going to go bad. I knew we weren't going to do this. I knew this was going to happen. That was going to happen. I, think, I just think they've been dishonest because the truth is we all expected that the squad that we had assembled was enough to get us to the 10. I don't want to slate a big man because as far as, it, as far as I can see from outside, I don't know Big Shane, uh, but as far as I can see, he's a decent lad. He's a nice guy. He had loads of personal problems to deal with. The loss of his father, a very, very, not just a father, but a close friend and confidant and advisor as far as his football was concerned. He comes up here, and there is an element, Andrew, there is an element, I think, where there is a bubble around that Premier League. They think that they're the superstars and that Scottish football um, is, is only amateurish. Uh, there's loads of guys have come up and thought that, and, and they've, they've had a rude awakening when they were on the park 
Um, your man, would you call him uh, the, the, the guy that went to the uh, Rangers and was Joey Barton? I said Barton, you know. Uh, the, 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 the bold Joey, you know, he was going to come up and show Bruni how to play football and all the rest of it. So these guys, they play in the Premier League and they think nothing can touch them. Maybe there's an element of that with Big Shane. I don't think he's an arrogant big fella. Uh, I think he's he's a decent big guy. But for goodness sakes, mate, uh, if there was ever a disappointment on the part, the big man was disappointing. Uh, just basics, basic defending. Um, now, whose fault was that? Because that wasn't somebody that was bought and we were all, you know, holding our, our, our hands and our heads. We were all cheering when Big Shane signed in the, the dotted line. We thought it was a, a brilliant uh, uh, coup to bring him to, to, to the Scottish Premier League. So the reason I make those points is I think it's dead easy to look back uh, and everybody's wise after they've got the 2020 vision and the, the benefit of hindsight. Uh, I'm going to put my hand up and say, I thought we were going to win the 10. I thought we had assembled a squad that was good enough to win the 10. I then look at the likes of Ryan Christie, who last season I thought was a world beater. This season he's resembled a panel beater. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, you know, the guy is undoubtedly a multi talented player, but he's just not done it for us. Eddie, I, you know, his head has gone. Um, now, I, I've read a lot of reviews and people have slated the, the, the team, slated Neil in particular. And two or three reviews I read recently, Andrew, not one of them mentioned COVID. Not one of them mentioned the fact that last season was a season like no other because you didn't have the ability to get the giller in the dressing room. They were all in the wee bubbles. They were all in different changing rooms. They hardly ever got the chance to unite as a team, to iron out some of their differences, to come together as a team. And as far as what I'm getting told off the park, it, it lent itself to a bit of cliqueism and um, some of the bubbles became cliques and people were talking about each other's stories and before you know it they weren't the pulling in the one direction they all weren't the pulling as a team they weren't the tying the ropes together and all of that had an effect now some people say oh Tommy that's a lot of bullshit what about the other team they all had, they all had the same problems and I'm, that's right but I've got to say mate there's, there's something special about playing for Glasgow Celtic and it's running out in front of 60,000 fans that's what gives you the extra man. And they never had it that year. There was nothing special about playing with Glasgow Celtic for a lot of their players, sadly. Um, that was lost. So, dead disappointing, Andrew. And I think it's inevitable that some of the fans and the fan groups ended up squabbling with each other, ended up having a wee bit of division here and there. Um, some of us can say, was the problems earlier? You know, I, I, I don't know if you read the recent interview that John McGinn gave which to me it dotted a lot of I's and it crossed a lot of T's because there had been a lot of talk about oh did John McGinn really want to come to Celtic I, I, I was getting told for a lot of people oh no he, he never ever wanted to play with Celtic anyway um, and it, that's why he didn't sign and then you read the interview that McGinn gives where he talks about uh, Rogers actually visiting him in, in, in his house he, talk, he talks about uh, Rogers talking about building his midfield around him uh, at the end of of, of Rogers' uh, second season, um, and and the idea then was that McGinn was coming. You know, he was going to be the the, the the future of the Celtic midfield, and then it dragged on and dragged on and dragged on. And he tells the story about he gets the mm -hmm. uh, the European game um, with uh, Hibs and Malta, and they're actually walking onto the park before the game and he still doesn't know whether he's playing because they're waiting and, and Lenny was the manager at the time and they're waiting in the bid the, the new bid the increased bid coming for Celtic and eventually he decides nah to hell with it I'm playing he knew he would have then became cup tied and the rest of it but he felt as though he'd been treated so shoddily for months and months and months he plays and then in August he gets a phone call from his agent listen I said well I want to have a tap shot with you and the, the rest is history see if you lose guys like that you remember the boy Castiga that, that, that uh, your man wanted to sign as well, uh, Rogers. You begin to say to yourself, did the rot set in during that second season, Andrew, when the, the talk about some of the signings, uh, you remember before the AK Athens game, um, the Rogers comes out and out of the blue attacks the, the board and the lack of signings, and that then becomes evidence that there's something no right and something was... You know, that became a pressure cooker because within a day or two, 
the board was briefing certain journalists and having a go at Rogers and talking about how well supported they'd been and all the rest of it. It was inevitable it was going to explode at some time, and obviously it did. So had the rot set in before what happened this season, Andrew, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I think what we need this season moving on is we definitely need a clear out. We need to have a different signing policy. We need to have a signing policy that is about getting ready-made players, that we don't just buy project players. We, 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 we go back to buying quality. I, I go back to Martin O'Neill's season. By the way, it's a very, there's a lot of parallels, isn't there? If you think of the, the, the season when Martin comes in, because Rangers had just won the league. I think it was, was it as many as 21 points, I think, we've won the league by. And, and Martin gets appointed. He never brought in project players. He brought in Hartson. He brought in Sutton. He, he brought in Lennon. He brought in Guppy. You know, he brought in players, Alan Thompson, that were accomplished, established, international players. We turned yeah, a 21-point yeah, yeah. deficit into a 16-point victory in a, a treble that season. So it can be done, Mark. Uh, Andrew, this isn't something that can be done. This can be done. But it's going to need, in my opinion, a lot of investment and a lot of changes, a lot of professionalism. And we need we need to have, in my opinion, opinion uh, uh, a management, a chief executive that stays out of the football side of things, that doesn't interfere with signing. We don't want a, a manager turning up and saying, uh, who's marrying Shaved? I thought we had a lot of uh, wingers already at the club. That that's no that's no good. We, we can't have that. Um, so if how's the man as as we've been told is the man, and if the hold up is genuinely because he's trying to get all of his backroom staff because he's not going to bring he's not going to come and take who's there. He's going to bring his own squad. I'm glad about that because Neil Lennon's single biggest mistake when he took the job was accepting the terms of the job. And the terms of the job was that he takes the staff that was already there and he wasn't allowed to bring in his own staff. And I think that was a handicap for Neil uh, from day one. Oh, 100%, Tommy, 100%. Um, I don't think we're going to see uh, someone at the club that had the, the money and the, and the, the power that Martin O'Neill had because that was, that was, that was when Peter Lawwell came in, you could see it was striking right up that there was there was players coming in, even when Gordon Strachan was there. Like Roy King came in, Paddy McCord came in, Strachan allegedly didn't know who Paddy McCord was. And this is coming from Paddy McCord, you know, Thomas Gravison. There was a lot of players come in that I don't think that the managers and I think that's when the suit started to get an influence in the dugout. So and, and I said it earlier on in the year, you know, there's too many suits and not enough track suits involved. And Fergus McCann would never have allowed that. Fergus wouldn't have accountants telling football people what to do and he wouldn't have football people telling accountants what to do. And when I had David Lowe on, David Lowe said about Fergus, he would do what he thought was right for the club and let the PR department deal with the fallout. That was, you know, everyone had a job within the club and that included the playing staff and the coaching staff. And it's not natural to be a manager with a coaching staff that's not yours because can you trust them? You need to be able to trust your right hand man, and I think Neil Tommy Johnson said Neil wanted him in, maybe 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 as 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 in a kind of director of football role, what he does a black pill or head skirt, whatever he is, and Tommy's very well respected in football in in, in, in football world, but he wasn't allowed to come, and so that would that tells you that the board was saying no, Peter was saying no, and now we have it's all if puts and maybe's now Tommy, but. In the end of the day, Rangers won the league um, and the fallout from that even. When they won the league, they were allowed to have a super spreader COVID party when the rest of the football fans throughout Scotland and, and elsewhere were in lockdowns. And again, they were allowed to gather outside the stadium, move to George's Square again. And what I witnessed on Saturday, Tommy, from the comfort of my own home through social media and news was a war zone in Georgia Square where punches and bottles were thrown freely under a chorus of fuck the Pope where I looked at unease and feeling in blood. Videos emerged throughout the day. It was chaos, including one um, of the first team. Now, but, but some say it was doctored. Some say it's real. I don't know. But, Tommy, the, the biggest losers in all this, it's not Saturday Rangers. It's the businesses in the city centre 
who have suffered. The first I heard was Conley's Bar. And I've been watching them for the past two weeks and all the people outside enjoying a drink and a bit of crack and chatting. And, you know, and Saturday's a wonderful day when people don't walk to go out and enjoy themselves. Restaurants in the city centre, nothing to do with Celtic or Rangers, closed. The Celtic shop, closed. Tommy, this wouldn't happen in any other city in the world. It wouldn't. Andrew, the level of hatred and bile, uh, anti Catholic abuse, anti Irish racism, uh, the, the illustration that you've got to try and highlight here is four men in London, four men with Palestinian flags are being investigated criminally for allegedly chanting anti-Semitic slogans. Now, whether it's anti-Semitic to criticise Israel for being an apartheid state or racist apartheid state or not, other lawyers can work that out. Four men are being criminally investigated for allegedly anti-Semitic slogans. 15,000 people were escorted through the streets of Glasgow chanting anti-Catholic bile and anti-Irish racism. None of them we're aware of are being criminally investigated for hate speech. That's the difference here that we need to now waken up to. And I'm hoping, I said earlier that sometimes, you know, things can change from defeat, from the ashes, something can arise. And from this disgraceful conduct, and you're absolutely right to highlight this is now one off. This happened in March. This whole thing happened in March, and now it's been repeated in May. Outside my house here in Paisley Road West in the south side of Glasgow, I was constantly abused throughout that day in March. Cars stopping, people shouting out, abuse in, things getting thrown into the garden. And the same happened on Saturday. Constant stream of Union Jacks getting waved out of cars, cars stopping outside, pumping their horns, people shouting in, anti-Catholic abuse, telling my wife to go and rattle her beads. That type of stuff is out and out hate speech. And it should be called out. It needs to be called out. And the one difference, Andrew, that I've noticed here in Scotland is at last... Some of the mainstream politicians have been prepared to call it for what it is. For far too long, I've heard politicians, first minister and other justice ministers say, we oppose all forms of sectarianism, all forms of bigotry. It's a sort of a catch-all. For the first time, they're actually now calling out the anti-Catholic bile that was evident throughout Saturday the anti-Irish racism that was evident throughout Saturday. They're calling it out. It's the first time. And that has never gone back in its box, Andrew. That has never gone back in its box. I can remember, I was reading the Wally Waddle speech. Some of you, some of your listeners who are old enough will remember it after the 72 debacle of the Barcelona invasion and the treatment of the city of Barcelona by... Rangers fans, and Willie Waddle went out into the centre of the pitch and appealed uh, to Genyang fans to reject and shun. He called them pikes and thugs. That was a bit hypocritical because in those days they still refused to sign a Roman Catholic, so they were practising discrimination while talking about inclusion. He had to make a similar speech after the invasion of Aston Villa um, later in, in, in the early 80s. And then, of course, it wasn't until 89 that they actually signed a, a Roman Catholic. What we've got to oppose, Andrew, is the whataboutery. We've got to shun it completely. We've got to close it down. I'm not accepting any longer these people. Oh, yeah, but what about the Celtic fans? What about what they do? I'm not interested. You know what? In the southern parts and southern states of America, those that were involved in lynching blacks used to say, yeah, but this one stole from the farm. This one abused his master. In other words, it's all right to lynch them because they did something to deserve it. We did nothing to deserve the anti-Catholic bile and the anti-Irish racism that comes out of that club, that seeps out of that club like the puss from a boil. 
that boil needs to be lanced. That club needs to own its own shame. They need to say loud and clear that as soon as up to our knees and Fenian blood is sang, the game stops. Fans are identified and ejected from the park. If they're serious, if they're serious about tackling this problem, Andrew, that's the type of steps that need to be taken. Other fans, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to say that there are no decent Rangers fans. Of course there are. I grew up with them. Some of them are my best mates. I know there are decent Rangers fans and I know that they're embarrassed by the antics of this white cult that seems to attach itself to Rangers like the barnacles on a ship someone described it as. Uh, that's exactly what it's like. But it needs to be called out. They need to be prepared to eject them themselves. Never mind authorities. Act yourself. Police yourselves. Get rid of these people because if you're not going to get rid of them, then the laws need to change and there needs to be much more intervention because that shame on Saturday is a shame on Scotland. And the contrast, see, some people try and make this comparison, Andrew, and I, I need to highlight this. Some people make the contrast of last Thursday in Glasgow, in Ken Muir Street, when the UK discrimination and the, the, the UK immigration van came into Pollock Shields in the south of Glasgow to take away, they said, two illegals, two Indians who they say were here illegally. They've been living in Pollock Shield for at least two years. They were considered neighbours of the people of Pollock Shield. The people of Pollock Shield said, no, we're not having that. We're not, cut, we're not having you dragging them out of their homes and taking them away. They deserve due process. We're not having that. And they stopped the van leaving the street. Within hours, there were over a thousand people came out. They, they, they didn't come out with flares. They didn't come out throwing bottles. They came out with sandwiches. They came out with poems. They came out with songs. They sat in the road. It was peaceful, civil disobedience. It was basic human solidarity. And I've read some Rangers fans comparing what happened then to what happened on Saturday and saying, oh, well, if it's okay for people to come out in Paul Shields, it's okay for us to come out. I'm sorry. You are comparing apples and pears, chalk and cheese. What you saw on Saturday was a festival of hatred. What you saw last Thursday was human solidarity. They are incomparable. And it's from that point of view that what happened on Thursday was Scotland blossoming, was Scotland at its best. Refugees, they're welcome here. Asylum seekers, they're going to get a hand of friendship. That's the type of country I want to grow up in, Andrew. I want to remind people that the Irish were once refugees in this city. We've got to open our hearts and open our hands and give some friendship to people who are seeking to flee the bombs and the destruction, most of it from our countries, most of it from our armaments. We've got to do that. And that's the type of country we've got to build. But what you saw on Saturday wasn't the country I want. That was the backward. That was hundreds of years ago. That was sheer and utter hatred and discrimination. So from what happened, Andrew, hand on heart, what I'm hoping is we now have a line in the sand and that we never, ever allow this to happen in silence again. We've sat at the back of the bus for far too long. We're not prepared to accept the anti-Irish racism, the anti-Catholic bigotry and discrimination any longer so out of that horrible event perhaps there will be some good yeah like I don't live in the six counties I live close to the six counties but I don't live in them Tommy so when I look at this and when younger people would be looking at this from 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 where I'm from this is this is alien to them you know this is and they say but if they're not if they haven't been to Glasgow and they're not a Celtic fan they, they are hearing oh just two sides of the one coin and Celtic fans was banned that and I have to say well well, show me show me where I was banned as that you know I've travelled you know me you know I'm anti-racist you know I've no time for sectarianism so I say why do you why would I follow a team like Celtic if they're out the same as Rangers and it just frustrates me because that's that's the opinion of some people because 
they're so far removed from it. And I'm so far removed from it, Tommy. I can go out for a five mile, six or seven mile walk and I'm not going to meet a Rangers fan. There's no one going to pull up outside my house and shoot obscenities in at my wife. And it shouldn't happen in Glasgow. But it does happen in Glasgow because of it's been allowed to happen. And as you say, hopefully now with politicians coming out and some of the mainstream media as well and calling this out because up until this, Tommy, it was left to women who had, who had started the call it out campaign because they didn't want the priest being abused or the chapel or an orange mask can buy the chapel. And because of social media now, we can see things faster and quicker. And I look and I see a police officer on duty in a range of scarf, which doesn't exactly portray an equal country. And you also have police officers sharing tweets about, about going on, on the lash in Georgia Square and people screenshotting them and sharing them and then tweets getting deleted and that. But it's out there. So it's a kind of an institutionalized problem as well, Tommy. Yeah. And this caveman mentality that, uh, you know, and I don't want to be tired with a brush that's anywhere near that. And I wouldn't follow Celtic if they were a team like that. So, and, and the reason I follow Celtic is many reasons. But one of them is because of the politics of the club and because of the social conscience of the fan base. Now, the board may be getting more and more removed from us, but the lads I go to games with and the people I meet in Glasgow are all decent people. And that's, and that's one of the attractions for me why I keep going back. But there's going to be, Tommy, there's going to be marches again in July, you know, as, as 1690 is celebrated. A battle that happened just out the road from me where I'm sitting here, Tommy, interviewing you. So, you know, this may flare up again. But as you say, it needs to be called out straight away. And it needs, and now they need to be putting things in place to say, look, this can't go on anymore. Why have we got anti-Catholic marches. Glasgow is full of different communities from all over the world have come to Glasgow and made it their home and this takes the whole city. And, and, I, and I'm not a city dweller, Tommy, but looking at the outside, it takes the whole city so far back. And then I see a peaceful protest on Sunday in Georgia Square and uh, uh, someone posted up after it. There was no broken bottles. You know, there was n- nothing being thrown at police. And, and you go, is this, is this the same city? Is this the same square? And yet, Tommy, I, I look, I look towards Celtic and I see our board, the people that run our club, making a song and a dance out of a, a small show of solidarity from the Celtic support, saying they tried to hijack Scott Brown's last game. And it disgusts me. No, definitely. These are people. When we sing, if you know your history, these are people that don't know their history because a lot of Celtic fans who don't understand why is there a natural sense of human solidarity with Palestine, they, 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 must, they must know that it comes from that feeling of shared oppression, that, that feeling of where we came from, the idea of a club that was established originally to help poor people, to recognise that poor people, regardless of religion, colour or creed, Anyone who is a human being deserves to be fed, deserves to be helped, deserves a hand of friendship. That goes to the very DNA of, of, of Celtic. And un- unfortunately, some people at the top of it don't, don't seem to understand it. They, don't, they, they might know the songs, but they don't understand the songs. And, and from my point of view, you look at the difference and contrast and compare what happens on, on Sunday in relation to a beautiful display, peaceful display of solidarity with a, a race of people, the Palestinians, who are finding themselves being subject to genocidal uh, uh, murder uh, by a, a country that's determined to wipe them out, uh, a, a country that has been supported and empowered by the rest of the world to wipe out a whole race. Uh, it's an international war crime. Uh, Nelson Mandela called it the moral cause of our generation. Palestine represents everything that is wrong with the world, the hypocrisy, the the double dealing, the dishonesty, the deceit. Because while Israel is armed to the teeth, while Israel is is given as much uh, financial support from America, they're allowed to to commit horrible human 
horrific crimes and break international law, but Hamas is, is somehow the equivalent. You know, it's, it's the, the what about today that we talked about? If you if you throw a rock at a tank, oh well, then the tank had the justification for for knocking down your home because you threw a rock at it. It is, it is disgusting, uh, Andrew. It really is disgusting. And the difference between that level of demonstration and the peaceful display of solidarity and, as you say, the utter hatred, the festival of hate that took place the, the, the day before could never be starker. Uh, and, you know, people will say um, these marches of hate should be banned. I, I, I've got to say I'm, I'm probably of a different um, opinion I think they should be rerouted. I, I, I don't think any of these marches should be allowed to go through residential areas, through through city centres. Let them go to parks. Let them let them go to wide open spaces if they want to have the festivals of hatred. I think if you ban them, then you give them a cause. Um, don't 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 ban them. Let let, let them go where nobody else sees them. Uh, definitely ban them from city centres. Ban them from going past uh, churches and other places of worship. Put them out in to areas um, where they will, they'll have to march long before they get to assemble uh, where nobody else can hear or see the hate that they're spewing. That, that's, that's what should happen. And, and slowly but surely they're dying off. Slowly but surely there's less and less of them going to these things. Hopefully education, hopefully maturity, hopefully the development of integration will eventually make it such that you don't need to ban them. They just, they're just nobody's interested in them anymore. However, what I think we've got to address is that the idea that there is an equivalence here. I, I can remember you talked about Celtic. I, I, I can remember, and you you recall this. It's well documented. I, I fell out with Celtic many years ago uh, after the Mark Walter Mark Walters debut at Parkhead. Um, I, I felt ashamed. I was there with a uh, an Irishman uh, who'd never been at a Celtic Rangers game before. I was standing in the Celtic end uh, with Big John Throne from 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 Ireland. He was a socialist and coming over doing some socialist uh, activity, and he wanted to go to a game. I was dead proud to take him to this game. Got him the ticket. Go into the game, um, and you know Celtic won two one. It was a, a great uh, victory. But Mark Walters was treated to uh, absolute diabolical treatment with the jungle throwing all sorts of bananas, monkey chants every time he went near the ball. It was disgraceful, it was disgusting, and I was ashamed. I was ashamed. I was there with a guy who, I, you know, I was dead proud of Celtic, and, and, and that's just a shame. And I fell out. I, I, I turned my back for a while, didn't go to the games for, 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 for many years afterwards. You think now, Andrew, you think now what happens if you hear a racist comment, never mind a chant anywhere at Parkhead, people are on it right away, quite rightly. People are on it, pointing them out, self-policing. We wouldn't have put up with it. The fact that you've got displays at uh, Parkhead now, not just of anti-racist displays, pro Palestine displays, the fact that you've got food bank collections on, on, on a regular basis, the fact the charitable work that's done, that shows you how far Glasgow Celtic has come since those dark days of the late 70s and early 1980s. My problem is Rangers haven't developed. Rangers' fan base hasn't progressed. The, the decent fans are still a minority. The overwhelming majority of them still think it's all right to chant about being up to their knees in Fenian blood. It's all right to say that all tags are targets. It's all right to say fuck the Pope. They think that that is acceptable language. We have to say to the people, have a look at yourselves. You are a shame on Scotland. And until you yourselves change, then you're never going to change your club either. Yeah, Tommy, and you, you, you say there, um, you mentioned Scotland there, and uh, the shame of, of Scotland. And when I was lining it up to come on the podcast, it was because we'd obviously come to the end of the season, but it, it was obvious, it was as well because there was a Scottish election and like when the American election finished, we had Charlie back on, Charlie Lord, who's a, a Belfast man who's, who's been based in Philadelphia for for decades. So we looked and we got, you know, his take on um, the elections over there because our listeners are, 
we, we, we've, a, we've a wide, I suppose, audience and um, that's proved as the podcast has progressed with some of the people that um, have come onto the podcast and the likes of Paul Heaton and Peter Hooten and non-Celtic people who are prepared to come on and talk about life and that because they see something in us and we see something in them because maybe it's a it's a solidarity thing or, or something. So I did want to get you on, Tommy, to talk about the election, but so much has happened since the seats in Glasgow but I do want to get Tommy because from looking in from the outside and I'm always real interested in whatever the elections are um, I'm a bit of a I'm not a know-all but I'm a bit of an anorak and I do like the counts and I do like watching the build up the election and then the next day or two as somebody, and then I kind of move on to something else but before the elections I'd seen you saying about the Alba party which I don't know much about uh, but from what I'm listening on the television, it didn't do too well. The SNP have grown again. Labour seem to be, they, they done well in Wales, Tommy, but it seems to be that in Scotland, they, they, they're a broken party. And obviously, the unionists are, are turning, seem to be turning towards towards the Tories in, in certain parts. But the, the, the story that kept coming through was the SNP. The yes, they didn't get the majority, but they were very close, Tommy. And I know from from having you live in Malone's and coming up to to, to Independence, the, the last referendum, it, it looks like Tommy, it's on the cards and closer to home. It looks like. We're getting closer to a border pole here as well, which is, which if someone had said to me, Tommy, you know, a decade ago or two decades ago, or when I was growing up, that the union was under threat and two different, two different, I know they're two separate cases, but Scotland looks to be pushing themselves towards another referendum. Listen, Andrew, the results of the Scottish election were brilliant for independence. Brilliant. They could have been better in terms of the number of people that were elected to the parliament who support independence. And that that was the theory and that was the strategy behind my position. Because my position all along, you've got two votes. And that, that, that's what makes the Scottish elections quite unique and quite strange. And sometimes it's difficult for people from the outside to understand it um, because mostly, most of the times you only get one vote. Um, but Scottish parliament elections, because there's an element of proportionality called the haunt system, which is supposed to make things fair, which actually what it's supposed to do, Andrew, and th- this is why it was introduced, it's supposed to prevent any one party ever getting a majority. That, that, that's that's why it was introduced as a system. Um, so this idea of the SNP nearly getting a majority is actually miraculous. Miraculous. They did it once in 2011 when it was a conflation of very different circumstances because they managed to just get the right number of list seats and the right number of, of, of constituency seats. Uh, the difficulty was it's never going to happen again because they're so dominant in the constituencies. And the way this Scottish Parliament election system works, the better you do in constituencies, the worse you do in the list. That's just the way it works. Like Glasgow, uh, the SNP won uh, 50% of the second votes, they're called the list votes. But they didn't win any less seats. It's just it's, it's, it's hard to explain to people. And therefore, my position all along was give your first vote SNP. I was a cheerleader for the SNP's first vote. Give the first vote SNP. Originally, I was selected to stand as a candidate, Andrew, uh, by a new party called Action for Independence, AFI, as, as they were called. And it was a group that was uh, trying to bring together small independence parties and groups to maximise the yes. So instead of wasting your second vote, you give your second vote to an independence party as well. Because if you give your second vote to the SNP, it would count as 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 actually happened. Over a million second votes were given uh, to to the SNP, and I think they ended up with in the whole of Scotland. I think it was two list seats for a million votes. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, so um, when Alapa was formed under the former first minister Alex Salmond. Uh, we had a choice to make. We, 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 we had a difficult choice in some respects because if we had stood, we would have split the vote even more. So uh, I had to be a big boy about it and I had to recognise that they probably had more chance than we had. Um, so we voluntarily stood down and we, we, we supported the Alapa party. Uh, some people have since said we were wrong, that Afi had a broader uh, appeal and things like that. Personally, I think we were right. We, we put unity first. We put Scotland first. 
uh, we put the, the, the cause before us as individuals. And sometimes you need to do that, Andrew. That's just the way life is. Um, so the election itself, SNP, largest number of seats, largest vote, um, biggest, uh, biggest turnout. This is the other thing that's dead important. That's the biggest turnout in the Scottish Parliament election since we were formed in 1999. That's the biggest turnout. So that's engagement, Andrew. People used to, you know, people when they run up to it were saying, oh, it's terrible having an election during COVID. <laughs> well, if I had an election during COVID, then it was a bigger turnout. Um, so COVID didn't have an effect. And the reason that's important, the reason I'm raising it, is it's also important to talk about the next referendum. People talk about, oh, you can't have a referendum during COVID. I'm sorry. Why not? Getting recovered from COVID needs independence. I don't want to go back, Andrew, to paying care workers and nurses pathetic poverty wages. I want to go forward. I want a new Scotland. I, I want a Scotland that does recover from COVID, that goes forward, not back. That needs independence. And what happened at our elections on the 6th of May was Scotland voted to give a mandate to the SNP, to the Greens. It's now a majority in the Scottish Party, bigger majority than we had before for independence. So it's inevitable, Andrew, there's going to be an indie ref too. Now, there needs to be keep pressure. There's, we're, we're, you mentioned Hope Over Fear earlier, the organisation that I've been involved in. We've, we've organised demonstrations in George Square every single year since 2014. Not a single arrest, by the way. Not a single broken bottle in the square. Not a single complaint about leaving messes behind us. Every single year we organise them. We've got one coming up in September. September the 11th, we're going to be in the square again and we're going to be calling for Indy Ref 2. We need to put pressure on the Scottish Government to actually call that referendum because people want out. Some people don't. We know that. Scotland's divided. That's, that's you know, that's that's life. You know, you hear people saying it's not the time. You know, they used to say that about slavery. It's not the time to abolish slavery. They used to say that about blacks getting the vote in America. It's not the time to give them a vote. They used to say that about giving us the vote uh, when, when, when the infringement, infringement acts in, 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 in across the UK. Oh, it's not the time. <laughs> It's never the time when the oh, oppressed want to give the oppressed, the, 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 those that are oppressed, never is a, never ever is it the time for the oppressors to stop the oppression. You know, it, it, we have to say it is the time. Mostly, Martin Luther King used to always say it, those who say wait inevitably mean never. That's what they really mean. And from my point of view, there's definitely, within the next 12 months, there's going to be another referendum, Andrew. And I think and I make a big appeal here to the uh, the more elderly, um, shall I say, Celtic-minded people, um, many of whom were frightened the last time. I, I, I couldn't believe it, Andrew, but many people, maybe it's to do with the board, the high hygienes, the toffs, the Tories that are in the, the board at Celtic Park, the, the Brian Wilsons of the world, the, the, the unionists, the art unionists, the, 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 what do you call them, the... The chairman, who's it? The Tory guy. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, and Wilson, you know, big, big unionist. John Reid before him, the warmonger. Uh, maybe maybe that seeps down to some of the Celtic fans. Oh, they're unionists. Maybe we should be unionists. No, please, don't do that any longer. Scotland is a different country. Surely, if anything, highlights that Andrew was the elections. In England, the Tories advanced. Can you believe it? The Tories advanced in England. In Scotland, the Tories were trounced and the Nationalists advanced. The SNP advanced. Scotland is a different country. We need to get out of this unfair, exploitative union, which is it means nothing but exploitation, using our resources, taking away our identities, making sure that we live in a society that is wholly unequal and unfair. We want to invest in our people, not in bombs. We want to pay our health workers a decent wage, not a wage cut. We want our schools and our hospitals to be invested in, not starved of funds. That means independence. And that's why I would appeal to everyone who's listening into this podcast. Next time around, don't be a unionist. Be someone who believes in Scotland's independence. And Tommy, the, the, the first time I interviewed you was uh, in Malone's or Sanic AM and it was I was coming up to the first referendum, I think, Tommy, or it may have been just after the referendum. 
And you, you, you had said that with not one bullet fired and the tick of a pencil, you can deliver independence. And it's a kind of a simplistic way of saying it, but if Scotland was to get independence so peacefully, it would send a, it would send a, a big message around the world that people can can make a change. At that time as well, you said it was it was about young people. Young people had voted, so the the vote was in the hands of the young people. Because I I do remember then, and I remember speaking to people over now. Business people didn't didn't want to leave the union. A lot of business people I spoke to didn't want to leave the union. A lot of older people didn't want to leave the union because of pensions and, and, and whatever. So so there was, uh, and you say fear over hope, there was fear. I also spoke to people who believed in the United Ireland but didn't believe in an independent Scotland, um, which it, from looking at it from the outside it could be confusing. The NHS really? was mentioned. The NHS was mentioned. Now, when I look towards the six counties in Ireland, I'm jealous of the NHS because for me to go to the doctor, Tommy, Fifty-five quid, and then Jeez. I have to pay. Then I have to pay for prescription, and sometimes that prescription can be over a hundred. So, it, for for me, when I look at the NHS, I go, "Wow, can you imagine we had that?" Um, I don't think anyone minds paying more taxes, Tommy, of when they, they have. Like, if you like, I look at Ireland, and uh, you know, I look at the governments that have been here for decades. Both right wing parties have always had the power. The, the Labour Party, any party that goes in with them, ends up coming out worse. That to prop them up. And I do look at the NHS and I look at it and I go, that, that, "That's that's my habit that people can go to the doctor and they don't have to pay because we have to pay to be sick here, and some people can't afford to be sick." That's the truth. The, the, the NHS to me, Andrew, is the epitome of the type of society you want to live in. An organisation, an institution, where everyone is entitled to first-class care at the point of need. How is it paid for? According to means. Progressive tax. If you're a millionaire, you're going to pay more in tax than an ordinary worker, and so you should do. That's what progressive taxation is all about. The NHS, to me, is the single biggest achievement of the Labour Party of 1945. It was a socialist achievement. It's why the Tories hate it. It's why the Tories want to dismantle it, because it is actually socialism in action. Everyone gets first-class care according not to your wallet, but according to your need. That's socialism in action, Andrew, and that's why they hate yeah, and it's funny, and I didn't I didn't bring it up on the podcast with Paul Heaton, but Paul had had asked the Tories to nationalise his rights to his records because he's he obviously makes a lot of money from royalties, and he said I want to nationalise and I want to put into back into the people, and they went no, and he said, well, why do I want? To? He says I'm not giving you my savings, but I'm giving you. And, and, and they refused, the Tories refused to accept a free gift yes. for, for the good of the people. And, and I, I, it just it just slipped my mind. It never came up when I was chatting to him. But it, it just goes to show how his little simple gesture is is, is, is just point blankly, no, because everything has to be private. It's the same here, Tom. Everything, look, we have a two-tier health system. If, you, if, you're, if you're not walking and um, you may get a medical card, you may get a medical card if you're not walking, but after that, you pay. And if you you go on a waiting list for treatment, or you get private health insurance, and that's the way it is. So, if you can afford it, you'll be treated the next day, Tommy. But if yeah. you can't afford it, you could be on a waiting list for two years to be treated. So, that's why I look at the NHS, and I would say, if that was a message going out to people, for me, that's what voting for anything for to keep something like Definitely. that. And um, because people said, oh, but what, what if, there's, if, there's a, if there's an independent Scotland or an independent Ireland, do you use the NHS? Like, well, it's just, it should certainly be part of the deal. You, see, you, shouldn't be, you, you know, you keep the good things and you get rid of the bad things, like you of said. You, do. you said, you know, nuclear warheads. They, they, they can have the nuclear bombs. They can have as many, they can have them in the Thames, Andrew. We'll give them the nuclear bombs, but we're going to keep our health service and we're going to develop it. And by the way, see by the time of the next referendum, Andrew. It is going to critically be, do you want to keep an NHS or are you going to have it privatised? Because Britain, you, the RUK, will privatise the health service. That's, it's simple. You're not just voting for Scotland's independence. You're voting to keep the NHS the next time. It's as simple as that. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, and and I I I know because we we've a we've a private health service here, and I, and I just know how how bad it is compared to my, my friends a couple of miles up the road who who can go to the doctor for free. But anyway, Tommy, just keep them with Scott. Just I I, I want to wish you the, the best of luck for Scotland in the Euros. I hope they do well. I hope the Saturday players do well and, and don't pick up any injuries. I wish I wish Ireland was there, but we we had a. We're going through a, a, a transition period, let's it's say. We, we, we've had, <laughs> if, you, if you think COVID has been a disaster for Celtic, it's been a bloody disaster for Ireland, you know. Right. You got players sitting on a plane and they were too close to each other. And this COVID for football has just been one bad story after another. But, Tommy, I, um, I don't know if I had my time machine the last time you were on the podcast. So, I just want you to take me back, Tommy, to, to a Celtic memory that sticks out of you or a moment in your life. And maybe as well, just tie it in maybe with a political moment in your life. Well, I suppose the moment that, that, that always sticks out to me, Andrew, is sometimes you've got memories as a wee boy that stick with you. And I remember attending the Scottish Cup final. And it was either 73 or 74. Um, and my favourite player at the time was Dixie Deans. I love Dixie Deans because he was just an unconventional centre forward. Um, and the, the the crowd that day was so large that I get moved with my dad. Uh, and I, I remember we were on my dad's shoulders and we get moved onto the gravel because uh, there was 106,000 at that game. I think it's the last time um, there's been a Scottish Cup final way over at where a six-figure number. And we won the game 6-1. Um, and Dixie Deans scored a hat-trick Billy McNeil scored a, a, a very good goal we spoke that day I remember speaking to Billy at dinner uh, a few years back there how memorable that goal was because he used to always score his feet but he scored with his feet that day um, and it was a fantastic memory I just Celtic in those days were just absolutely invincible they were brilliant and I think it was a year later we then were in the Driver Cup final against Hibs again and who scores a hat trick? Dixie Deans. So two two hat tricks, two seasons uh, in a row. Uh, and the big thing was the reason it stuck in my mind was because lots of people were attacking Dixie and were upset with Dixie before that Scottish Cup final against Hibs because he'd missed the penalty uh, against uh, Inter Milan. Um, we were in. I mean, <laughs> think of these days, um, uh, and we were in the European Cup semi final. <laughs> When the penalties, nothing each over there, nothing each at Bargain. Penalties were, were penalty kicks away for another European Cup final. Um, and Dixie blasted his penalty out of the bar. Um, so everybody was angry with him and all the rest of it. Um, and he was still picked. Brock still picked him to, to, to play in the final. And what a reply. He scored a hat trick. Um, so that's a huge memory for me, mate. Um, I'm not sure that it ties into. Um, anything political um, because you know I was still a young boy at the time um, perhaps it, it does remind me of, I think it was 72 or 74 it was either 8 or 10 when I first really probably learned about politics and it was on the knee in my mouth uh, because I couldn't play with my wee soldiers that I used to have in the house um, because there was no lights the lights had went out and the candles were on and it was during the power streaks uh, because the miners were on the street. And my mom, I was moaning about it. My mom sat me on her knee and she explained about these men that went miles underground to dig this stuff called coal that was brought out of the ground to go into machines to make electricity. And that they were getting, it was a very dangerous job, very dirty job, and they were getting paid very good wages. And therefore, instead of moaning about this, a lack of light, I should actually be supporting the miners. Now, at the time, I remember thinking, oh, I still want to play with my soldiers. But they wee, they wee things stick in your head, Andrew. Uh, and I think that's the type of memories that made me the socialist I am. And one thing that sticks from one one name that comes up there, Tommy, when, I, when, when you link the two together, but a couple of names come up, uh, and all football greats, Jock Stein, Shanksy, Busby, you know, all... All former miners. You know, and, and it's funny when we had Johnny Owen who who done the documentary, um, the film about him. When we had Johnny Owen, he said that the community that Shankly came from, it, it's not there anymore because the mine's not there. So yeah, that's uh thanks very much for that because that got me thinking now and um 
of, of these great men that, and the communities they came from. Listen, Tommy, it's been a pleasure. Um, thanks very much for coming on. As I said, I wanted you on because of the elections, but so much has happened in the time that we, we you know, we spoke about you coming back on. Definitely. So, uh, listen, hopefully talk to you next season and maybe we'll get Andrew, you on. I'm going to say that, mate. I, I wanted to finish by giving another shout out for the Willie Mealy Memorial Group. I think you're going to get somebody from the group on, onto the Yes, podcast of course, yeah. And, and, and it'll be brilliant. Please support them. But I also want to say... I look forward to this season, mate. Get me on in my loans again and, and let's have another redo because you have fun, you have some fantastic events there at my loans. Only, I hope that, I think the guy who used to be there is not there any longer. Keith's um, gone, yeah. We'll miss, we'll miss Keith. Very sad. Big shout out for Keith. He's a fantastic guy, really lovely guy. But hopefully, the, whoever's taking over his, his job will, will be as friendly to more than 90 minutes. Yeah, but look, we'll, we'll, we'll at the moment... I just want to get back to Glasgow and then when we get back then we can start looking at somewhere for our little pre-match get together. Till then, Tommy, it's... Uh, we hail, we'll hail. Enjoy the summer and hopefully the next time I speak to you we'll be your manager. You know something, Andrew? I hate the song. I hate the song because it's got connotations and it's got association with a particular war uh, monger and, and a war criminal. But things can only get better. <laughs> Well, I can't get any <laughs> Listen, mate, all the best. Take care. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, cheers now. Thanks to Tommy for once again taking the time out to chat to us and look forward to chatting him in the flesh again at one of our live events. And as he said himself there, he's looking forward to getting back to Salig AM, hopefully Malone's, but who knows where we'll be once we get back to Glasgow. And if you want a bit of further listening, you can check out Tommy's conversation with us from last August in the podcast archives at selicfanzine.com forward slash podcast. It's also available in the ACAST library or if you just Google it, you should be able to come so the latest fanzine has finally gone to Richie to put his graphic design touches to it and we thank him for that and we'll hopefully have that out the digital issue maybe the end of next week and then once we get back to the printers we'll have the print copy and then we'll be taking a wee break from the fanzine then till probably mid-July if there's anything happening for the pre-season and, and the Champions League preparations and hopefully there will be by then and just a reminder, anyone taking out a 12-issue subscription will receive a free T-shirt in the post. And uh, thank you for your continued support. All subscribers also get the digital copy of each issue while they wait for the print copy to drop through the letterbox and they also have access to our back issue library. Without everybody who bought the fanzine through the online shop, uh, I can't thank you enough because we wouldn't have been able to put an issue out each month or every five weeks, whatever it was, without your support. But we'll be back next season and we'll have match day sales. But please keep subscribing because we don't know when we're going to get back. And the print issue is where we started. I know the podcast has really taken off and we're walking now on Celtic Fanzine TV and, and, and all the articles on the website. But my heart is still in the fanzine because that's where it all kicked off. And I know all the boys that write for us, they always keep the best articles for the fanzine. So thanks to all the subscribers. Thanks to everyone who bought a copy. Thanks to all the contributors and, of course, thanks to all the sponsors for keeping more than 90 minutes alive during the past year. Don't forget to visit our online shop. We have a couple of new T-shirts and a few new bits of merch coming on board in the next couple of weeks, so keep an eye on that. As always, I have to thank my comrade across the desks here in the studio, Ronan McQuillan, for producing yet another quality show. He's not singing us out today, but we do have a nice tune to sing out with from Billy Bragg. But I also want to thank Daniel Faulkner for his work this week on Celtic Fanzine TV, Talk of the Terrace. And we also have a new history podcast coming out with David Potter as a guest when we talk Celtic cult heroes. And that'll be out next week. So don't forget to keep going on a bit, but hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel and tell your friends about it. And if you like what we're doing and you would like to support us, you can do so by visiting CelticFanzine.com where you can become a member, subscribe, buy or donate for the price of a pint as we try to keep everything real and keep it independent. Your support, as I said, helps us to produce quality independent fan journalism, podcasts, video content and I know you're fed up listening to me about saying free live events when we can get back but we're getting closer and we are looking at venues. 
So please download our app, it's free, and you'll have access to all the podcasts, articles, daily news, video and info on those upcoming events, the fanzine and our online shop, all the touch with button on your phone or tablet. All episodes of the podcast are available across all platforms, so hit that subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. The podcasts are also available on Celtic Fanzine TV and also by visiting the website and it's Celtic Fanzine forward slash podcasts. And I'll have all those details in the podcast description if you don't remember them. And for further listening, can I recommend what we put out during the week? We put out a Gary Kelly podcast from... We, we interviewed Gary a couple of years ago and we thought we'd stick out some of the interview as it was just past the anniversary of when Salik played Leeds and all that money that was raised that night went to cancer support in Leeds and in Drogheda, my hometown. And when you see the legacy that Gary has left in the town with that cancer centre. It's 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 amazing. So if you want to check that one out, we have put that one out Monday. And on Thursday, we had a talk of the terrace on the YouTube channel with Average Joe Miller joining me once again. And it was great to chat to Joe, I suppose it's the closest I get to a chat in the pub or a match day chat from the terrace. And Joe also took us back to his trip to Palestine and what he went to there. And next week, we kick off the Grand Old History podcast on Celtic Fanzine TV as well, with David Potter and myself, when we'll be chewing the fat over Celtic cult heroes from Dan Doyle right up to Shinsuke Nakamura. Don't forget to follow us on social media or on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. And thanks for everyone who gave us a follow since last week. If your business or Celtic Supporters Club like the podcast and would like to become a sponsor, please email us at info at celticfanzine.com and you can contact us through the website or message us on social media. So, folks, that's it. No football. The season's over, but we're sticking around for a few more weeks before we take a wee break. I hope all the city centre businesses in Glasgow can get back to normal this weekend and people can go out and enjoy a beer in the beer gardens and hopefully the police won't be marching their Rangers fans through the city again so they can wreck the place. But they've nothing to celebrate, I don't think. Oh, wait. July is coming up. Anyway, folks, enjoy your weekend. Stay tuned. Keep safe. Keep the faith. Get your vaccine because I got my first one yesterday. And I'm going to play you with a Billy Bragg song entitled Take Down the Union Jack. Take down the Union Jack. It clashes with the sunset. And put it in the attic. With the emperor's old clothes When did it fall apart? Sometime in the 80s When the great and the good gave way To the greedy and the mean Britain isn't cool, you know It's really not that great It's not a proper country doesn't even have a patron site It's just an economic union That's passed its sell by date Take down the Union Jack It clashes with the sunset and ask our Scottish neighbours if independence looks any good Cos I just might understand how to take an abstract notion Of personal identity and turn it into nationhood Is this the 19th century that I'm watching on TV? Dear old Queen of England Handing out those MPEs Member of the British Empire That doesn't sound too good to me Gilbert and George are taking the piss on they? Gilbert and George are taking the piss What could be more British than here's a picture of me bum Gilbert and George are taking the piss 
Take down the Union Jack It clashes with the sunset And pile up all those history books But don't throw them away They just might have some clues About what it really means To be an Anglo-Saxon In England.co UK to be an Anglo hyphen Saxon in England.co.uk